Due to some uh, unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Nash was not able to join us in person today. He will be joining us uh, online, as you see here. Uh, each of you should have at your table um, a number of documents provided by Dr. Nash that he's going to refer to during his lecture today. So if you haven't got uh, those copies, there should be some extra on the table back there. And uh, if everybody is seated, we'll get started. Okay. <clears throat> um, welcome. This is uh, the Northwood University Freedom Seminar. My name is Dale Matchek. I'm the chairman of the economics department here at Northwood University. And our speaker this afternoon is an institution at Northwood. If anybody bleeds Northwood blue, it's Timothy G. Nash. Uh, his level of responsibility has uh, increased over the years, beginning as a resident advisor when he was a student here, uh, later serving as uh, chairman of the econ department, a role which I do now, then dean uh, of the undergraduate school, then dean of the graduate school, provost of the university. Uh, he has uh, lately served as a um, uh, was until he uh, became emeritus recently. He was David Fry, a professor of. Uh, let's see. I want to get this. The and free market economics. David Fry endowed chair or the McNair endowed chair in free market economics here at Northwood University, and he is the director of the McNair Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise. Uh, which has graciously sponsored the Freedom Seminar this year. And uh, this is, of course, uh, being held here at the McNair Center. So uh, Dr. Nash continues to direct the McNair Center here and is very active, as you can see, by all the publications, uh, all of which are recent and uh, produced um, uh, by the McNair Center, authored by Dr. Nash and others. Um, he has also traveled extensively throughout the world talking about free markets and entrepreneurship in countries from China to Mexico to Poland and Switzerland. And uh, he got his, as I said, his undergraduate from Northwood, his PhD from Wayne State University. And uh, he is uh, one of the editors of the book that we all, all read here at Northwood University, When We Are Free. Um, in any case, I, I always tell people, when there's good things happening at Northwood University, there's a good chance that Dr. Nash had something to do with it. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome back to the Freedom Seminar, Dr. Timothy G. Nash. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Dale, for those uh, those kind remarks. And uh, if I might throw a bouquet Dr. Matchek's way, I have to say that um, one of my uh, – if, if it was a great thing or, or a good thing, I think a great thing happening at Northwood was the day that uh, uh, we, with uh, quite a bit of, uh, of um, shall we say, inspiration and word from myself, uh, we hired um, a Dr. Matchek away from the University of Michigan, one of the great hires in my, my time at Northwood. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I really do wish I could be there with you. I was there at the first Freedom Seminar almost uh, four decades ago, and uh, it, it's one of my favorite events. And it, it really is the, the uh, quintessential example of the, uh, the Northwood idea. I was able to watch uh, from Ann Arbor last night um, uh, two good friends, uh, uh, Stephen Moore and Jonathan Williams, do a great job last night. I unfortunately missed... Uh, 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 the the uh, talk by Dan Smith this morning, I know it was a home run because that's just the kind of person Dan is. So I, I hope to follow in the tradition set uh, for the Freedom Seminar so far. And I, I'll simply say to you that, um, as Dale noted, you have a series of handouts. And having been involved with the Freedom Seminar for such a, a long time, I know that um, this will speak more directly uh, to the students in the room as you're preparing to write uh, your reviews of the speakers and your research paper. So hopefully uh, these uh, materials will be useful uh, for you. And as Dale noted, we publish a lot of things at McNair. And uh, going to the McNair website, uh, a lot of good upgrading has been done by Kate 
Hessling, our director of uh, communications and public relations. And uh, and when you look at the great work she's done along with uh, with her boss, Rachel Valdeseri, uh, you'll be able to find a lot of materials that may help you with your Freedom Seminar paper on the McNair website. So without further uh, delay, I'd simply say to you, we're, we're gonna look at these um, these handouts. And then if we have time, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a, a recent paper that we have uh, that's gonna be published by the American Institute for Economic Research, probably uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, the, the point of my talk is to really give you a look at the US economy in the post pandemic era. And um, yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that we are we are away from the pandemic. And I would also say to you that some cutting edge work is being done by our own Michael McCovey and uh, one of his uh, associates at the American Institute for Economic uh, Research and actually determining how we handle the pandemic. And so I look forward to seeing uh, Michael and his colleagues' research. I think it's going to make national news. It's that good. Uh, the, at least the preliminary uh, materials that Michael and I have discussed. So the, the, the economy is in a really unique position. And if you think about the pandemic from an economic perspective, it was one of the worst economic downturns since the Great Depression. But from a pure economic downturn, ladies and gentlemen, it, uh, it didn't last very long. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve, the, uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Labor, the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis is saying that basically it was a really deep, short recession of less than one quarter. But we had, uh, you know, negative declines in, <clears throat> excuse me, in economic growth and in employment that were shocking in the uh, in the second quarter, and then a dramatic rebound in the third and fourth quarters of 2020. So, I think one of the things that's important to note, and, and if you look at the town hall uh, handout. Uh, that uh, it, it speaks to supporting the the people of the Ukraine. I, I think that that's a, it's an interesting piece, and it's really written uh, to talk about really what I would describe as the ethos of the United States or or the the foundation of the U.S. economy. You know, America is not a perfect country, but I, I would argue it's the greatest country in the history of the world for one reason and one reason only. It has a self-correcting mechanism and it's among the freest economies uh, in the history of the world. I would argue in terms of size, scope, achievement and freedom, the greatest economy in the history of the world because it has the self-correcting mechanism. And, and, and so the, the point I mean by that is, clearly when you look at the United States, in 1776, we didn't create a perfect country. Women not being able to vote, wrong. Slavery, wrong. Uh, individuals that, that didn't have the right to be who they are, whether it's sexual preference or other uh, variations, wrong. But the fact of the matter is, the United States with the Constitution has this self-correcting mechanism that allows the United States to become this better place, not just sociologically, but certainly also economically. And so when you look at that piece, it really refers to examples of the United States from Thomas Paine's, these are the times that try men's souls. Paine was one of the great pamphleteers and he literally encouraged George Washington and his troops. When most historians say there was a good chance that the Americans were ready to lose the American Revolution, Leighton in 1776, Thomas Paine wrote those very famous words in the article that many people argue motivated Washington's troops, turned the American Revolution around. Uh, there's the famous painting in the Capitol building of Washington and his troops crossing the Delaware. And it was a very famous 
uh, 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 crossing of the Delaware because two days later they would defeat the British at Trenton, New Jersey and go on to have two other key victories and turn the tide of the American Revolution. And then we would go on and fix the problems that I spoke of earlier. And if you look at what's happening in the Ukraine, you know, you think about, um, uh, look at uh, uh, the, some of the famous quotes in there, uh, uh, such as, I chose to ignore others because I wasn't Catholic or I wasn't uh, uh, Jewish. And then look at what happened in World War II. Uh, the quote in there by a famous educator, Heim Gannat, who, uh, uh, literally published the words of a Jewish Holocaust survivor uh, that uh, the Holocaust survivor wrote to a principal in a New York City school system after the end of World War II, because the, the survivor of the Holocaust who had come to the United States seeking freedom after World War II wanted to point out to the teacher that wonderful educated minds can do hideous things. And, and in that in that quote, uh, Gannat points out in the letter from the Holocaust survivor to the principal, you know, it was educated people that built Auschwitz, built the gas chambers, uh, literally killed babies with injections or machine guns. And so educated people can do terrible things and that we need to educate people to be productive members of society and to be people that will not let tyranny spread. And so it's in that spirit that I that I say, we need to help the brave people of Ukraine, but it's also gang in that spirit that I would argue that the American economy continues to rebound. The American economy has faced tremendous obstacles, but it always seems to correct itself. It always seems to fix its problems and continue to be the beacon of liberty. And when you when you think about um, uh, you know even no matter how you feel about the southern border crisis, you have millions and millions of people. If this is a bad country, if this is a country that that is 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 declining and and nobody wants to be in this country, why why did over two million people illegally and I'll use the term illegally cross the border? and come into the United States last year. Why are we gonna easily break that record this year? Because this is a great country where people want to be. And so we're not perfect, but we're a self-correcting mechanism. And, and that's why our economy was able to handle the pandemic, literally lead the research efforts to come up with the vaccines to fight the pandemic and also to turn around and rejuvenate not just the US economy, but help save a large portion of the world from the pandemic. It's because of freedom and it's that self-correcting mechanism that handles social issues like women's suffrage and slavery and handles issues like pandemics and economic downturns because of the freedom and the creativity of the human spirit. So that's why I'm optimistic about the economy. And it, it doesn't mean that we don't have issues moving forward, but we, we have uh, our challenges, but we have that free economy where we can do things and do things effectively. Uh, the second piece that, that you have uh, is the handout with our monthly economic outlook. And if you uh, read it and you like that and you'd like to get the outlook every month, uh, just send me an email at, uh, well, you, my email's on in, in that, uh, in the handout, and we'll get you on the, uh, the regular uh, the distribution list. But when, when you look at our, our monthly uh, economic outlook, one that just came out for uh, February and early first half of uh, March, uh, we've got another one coming out pretty soon in the next week. Uh, the, you know, the big cause of the day is inflation. And it's a problem that we address every month in the monthly economic outlook. And, and the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that a year ago, 14 months ago when President Biden took office, 
President Biden's administration, the Federal Reserve Bank, all said that inflation was not a problem, that it was transitory, that it was due to the pandemic and some supply chain issues. Well, supply chain issues are, are not inflationary. That's a supply demand, generally a short-term issue. Inflation always is a monetary phenomenon. And for those of you in the room that really aren't that familiar with Milton Friedman, it was a great honor when Dr. Friedman told us he was gonna write the foreword to When We Are Free. Milton Friedman, in my opinion, is the greatest economist of the 20th century bar none. And uh, even though I probably like uh, Professor Hayek better than Professor Friedman, Dr. Friedman's a person that I got to know personally, had dinner on a few occasions with he and his wonderful economist wife, uh, Rose. And Dr. Friedman developed a, a, a global reputation and won the Nobel Prize for his work in analyzing inflation. And, and what Dr. Friedman said is that when the government excessively produces money at a rate faster than goods and services, there's no other option than prices will go up. And that's exactly, ladies and gentlemen, what's happened in the last two years. From President Trump to President Biden, they had good intentions for the most part, but they dramatically increased the money supply and the monetary uh, Federal Reserve balance sheet. In, in uh, 2008, uh, just before President uh, Obama became president, the Federal Reserve balance sheet was just under $1 trillion. Currently today, it's over, just a smidgen over $9 trillion. The government has produced dramatic increases in the last two and a half years uh, around the pandemic. And, and so we've added four to $5 trillion to the Federal Reserve balance sheet by buying up that, that government debt so that the government could spend money to stimulate the economy. Was it bad that the government stimulated the economy in a pandemic? No. Is it, is it improper that we did it to a much greater level than we should have? Absolutely. Uh, did we overshoot the target? Yes. Could we have stopped uh, maybe a, a trillion shy in the Trump years or or certainly, certainly um, uh, after the first trillion in the Biden uh, presidency, and we would have much lower inflation today? The answer is absolutely yes. The government spent way too much money, and now we have an inflation problem. And unfortunately, uh, we're gonna have to deal with it by reducing the money supply, which as you take money out of the economy, there's gonna be less money for people to borrow with credit cards. There'll be less money for people to borrow to buy automobiles. There'll be less money for people to borrow to buy homes. And the interest rates are going to go up. And if you look at it right now, if you, if you study things like Dr. Matchek and I do from an economic perspective, uh, look at what's happened just with 30 year fixed mortgage interest rates. At the end of 2021, the rate was 3%. And today the rate is 4.5%. So just in a little over three months, the 30-year uh, fixed interest rate on a home mortgage has gone up 50% from 3% to 4.5%. If it goes to 6%, it's doubled. And I think by the end of the year, we're gonna have home mortgage rates at at least 6%. So that, that's going to create a, a problem moving forward. And, and so if you look at the, the variables that we're dealing with today in the economy, uh, most of the difficulties are due to inflation. And we have to understand that government cannot print money excessively and not expect anything other than inflation. Uh, for some of the older folks in the room, you might remember the late 70s and the early 80s when inflation was actually 
uh, much higher than it is today. And home mortgage interest rates got to be double digit because the government was fighting inflation. And we had the same scenario in the early to mid 1970s, home mortgage interest rates were 30 year fixed were between three and 4%. By the end of the seventies and into the early eighties, they got to be double digit. And they got so high gang that they became variable interest rates. A bank wouldn't give you a fixed interest rate because the bank didn't want to get paid back in fixed uh, 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 interest rates of say three or four percent or even five percent when the inflation rate was six or seven or eight percent. Because you know from your economics classes with wonderful teachers like Dr. Takarov or Dr. Matchek or Dr. McCovey, if if the interest rate is three percent and the inflation rate is five percent. Well, the uh, the person that's holding the interest rate is actually losing two percent. So the or or another way of looking at it, if your wages go up by five percent and inflation goes up by eight percent, which is where it is right now, then your real income is actually not better off by five percent. You're actually off by, negatively. You're you're worse off by three percent. And and those are the the, the difficulties or the issues that we're, we're facing uh, in today's economy. So the real question as we look at the, the future economy is what will the Federal Reserve be able to do? Will the Federal Reserve be able to bring inflation down and not cause a recession like happened in the late 70s and early 80s when when Paul Volcker, Volcker was chairman of the Federal Reserve. And we went from President Carter to President Reagan. And uh, the first two years of President Reagan's presidency were very difficult because he had to uh, deal with the inflation fighting of Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve. My worry today is that Chairman Powell at the Federal Reserve, uh, he may not have the courage to cut inflation quickly, and we will either have longer inflation and a very bad recession, or if he deals with it quickly, we could have a, a, a short re recession in early 2023 and then get the economy rebounding quickly, uh, like happened under President Reagan. He, because the, the uh, recession, what was was only uh, 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 two quarters uh, uh, in terms of once Volcker started to fight inflation at the Federal Reserve. It was a it was a short, difficult uh, recession. So that's uh, the first thing that uh, that that I think we have to look about regarding the post pandemic economy. What what's uh, what are the factors going to be like as it relates to uh, as it relates to the uh, the inflation? So that. That's what I wanted you to take from the uh, the uh, the outlook, the uh, the economic uh, 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 monthly economic outlook. Third piece that I'd like you to take a look at is the automotive news piece because here's an interesting uh, uh, situation with the current economy. And this is a piece that uh, we have a, another article coming out in automotive news in the next couple of weeks. Uh, myself and uh, one of our alums, Dan DeVos. Uh, you may know the DeVos family uh, relative to the the only Orlando Magic. They co-founded the Amway Corporation. Dan is a, is the president of the uh, or chairman of the board of the Orlando Magic basketball team, but he owns about 40 automobile dealerships. And Dan and I went to school together, and we're writing a piece on interest rates and the automobile industry. Uh, that's kind of a follow-up to the the piece that's at your table. So when, when you look at the economy, there's some interesting things that are taking place. And as you go through that article and, and people ask the question, why other than inflation are used automobile prices so expensive? And if you, if you looked at the data from last month, used cars are up 41%. 
from where they were in this, you know, roughly this time in 2021. And so this article, even though it's uh, it's it was written about nine months ago, is still very prevalent and relevant to what we're dealing with today. And so the, these are factors uh, that uh, the pandemic uh, drove, and in some cases, uh, in, inflation caused. So if you look at the uh, the factors in this um, in this article, the thing that I think is important for you to look at or or to focus to focus in on is the fact that um, when the chip shortage came about, the chip shortage came about for a lot of different reasons. A uh, part of it was the global pandemic. A uh, part of it is the fact that the largest supplier of chips uh, happens to be the state of Texas, and Texas had a terrible, uh, uh, an unexpected freeze last uh, winter, and it, it caused the, the chip shortage in Asia to be exacerbated by the chip shortage of of a, a winter, a weather-related chip shortage in uh, in in Texas that put things back, uh, delayed things by by at least a month. Uh, you not only had the pandemic-related uh, uh, chip shortage in Asia, but you had a tsunami that hit the coast of Japan and literally caused a shortage uh, of, of dramatic proportions uh, to the largest single uh, chip manufacturer in the world in Japan. And, and so it's been a, a difficult time rebounding and getting uh, chips for automobiles and other devices back up to uh, to global scale and and so then on top of the uh, uh the chip shortage we in the article we list a number of of uh of different uh, factors uh, some of them literally had to do with the government subsidies uh the government gave out two different tranches of money that resulted in thousands of dollars uh to the average american household and uh, that gave people m the money to buy they had used automobile that they may not have thought about. And, and so that was a factor when we did our research that, that had individuals buying things that they, that they would not have. So the new cars were delayed because of chips. I remember going down to Michigan State last summer and they had thousands of General Motors automobiles parked in Michigan State parking lots uh, and that just didn't have the chips. The cars were completely built, and all they needed was to add the chips, but the chips weren't available. So then you had individuals that needed an automobile, and they couldn't get a new automobile. They needed a new one. So they were buying used cars that were maybe a year old, cars coming off a lease from a, an automobile rental car company, et cetera. And, and so that factor uh, drove up the price of used cars because if the market wanted 17 million new cars and the market in the United States could only produce 14 million because of the chip shortage, new car buyers ended up buying one-year-old used cars and used car buyers that would normally buy used cars wanted to buy those cars. And then you had also the individuals that could now buy a car because of the government subsidies. And so those three factors helped drive uh, the price of used cars up. And again, this is all market economics. And so you, you look at that factor, you look at the fact that automobiles are better built today than ever before. An automobile going over 100,000 miles is almost a given. When I was a kid, I'm 64 years old. When I was a kid, uh, if an automobile made it to 100,000, that was a wonderful thing. And, you know, if you're old enough to remember, Mercedes-Benz had these beautiful circular medallions that you'd put on the grill of a Mercedes Benz for every time an automobile got over uh, 100,000 mile increments. So if you had, if your car went over 200,000, you had two of these medallions. If it got over 300,000, you had three medallions. And I was talking to one of my buddies uh, at General Motors and I said, you know, Cadillac ought to do this. And he said, eh, he said, it, it's not uncommon uh, most Cadillacs get well over 200,000 miles today. So automobiles are better, they're lasting longer, 
And as they last longer, you're seeing that um, uh, people are then looking at trading in vehicles. And the, the, the end result of it is that as the, 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 the fleet gets older, we're seeing a lot of these things happen at the same time. And that's also driving up the price of, uh, of used automobiles in general. So as you go through and you look at the eight factors, the, the thing that's important is not just to understand what's causing certain products or prices to go up. They're basically supply demand issues. The market is sending signals. And when, when computer chip manufacturers are paid a higher price, it gives them the incentive to build a new factory if they need to. It gives them the incentive to add a new shift. They don't always right away, ladies and gentlemen, make more money it, because it costs more to add a shift or, or to build a new plant. But it's the marketplace responding to individual needs. And uh, you're, you're, I believe that you will see by the end of this year, you're going to see the, 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 the price of automobiles decline. You're going to see the price of used automobiles decline. And uh, by the way, you're already seeing. There was a report out this morning that um, some of the big chip manufacturers are actually predicting that they will be uh, uh, increasing chips overall by 20% within the next two months. And it'll be interesting to see if the demand for automobiles is still there uh, as the new chips uh, uh, go to the market. So as you're analyzing the economy, the, the, new, the new point with regard to the economy is that as things change, if it's a free and competitive e economy, the market will adjust. And, and so I, I would just simply say to you, that article, even though we wrote it for Automotive News, really applies to many other industries and, and many other products. And, and so the, um, the economy is changing but where the economy is effective and efficient, uh, the economy does uh, does quite well. And and then the other the other uh, point, it was interesting. Uh, the next article um, that I wrote with Dr. Stehauer, our wonderful uh, academic VP and chief academic officer, and uh, one of my favorite alums, Lisa McLean, who's a U.S. Congresswoman from Michigan. Uh, the, the, where it, where it, uh, the, the article that talks to, about bracing yourself. You got to brace yourself for, for changes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, reflects on some of the points that, uh, Steve Moore, especially, but Steve and Jonathan were making last night. When you don't have a free market, people don't get products and you have shortages. The thing to note about a free market is that uh, people, maybe they didn't get a, a, a new car, but they got a used car. And yes, prices went up, but products were available. There, you know, you, you, you look at it, you might've had some short-term shortages, but the market always responded. And the market oftentimes uh, responded with substitutes. You know, I know at the Nash household, when, when beef got a little, a little bit too high, we substituted turkey or, or, or chicken. And, and, and so the, there were times when we didn't always get what we wanted, but you can tell that uh, by looking at me, I, you know, there wasn't a meal that I missed or that I, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we, we, the supply and demand issues create uh, uh, the ability in a free market to handle supply chain shortages, to handle inflation. And, and you're gonna see with this next piece, one of the key points is that bad regulations and high inflation are so damaging to the poorest in our economy. You know, a, a guy like uh, myself who blessed to have a good job and a, a wonderful job from my vantage point, my wife has a, a wonderful job at DuPont, we do well. But it, the, the concern that I always have is for people just getting started or or, or poor individuals uh, in the economy because we, we, we forget how difficult these things are. And so what I would ask you to do with the uh, Stehauer 
McLean Nash piece on Brace Yourself is to look at the fact that um, a lot of the problems we face today in our economy, in my opinion, is because of the Biden administration's belief that we can regulate our way to a green new economy and it's going to be perfect. And I would argue that it's not. What's happening is that when you look at the uh, uh, President Biden, I'm sure is a good man. I've never met him, but I'm sure he's a good and decent human being. But I, I just believe he's wrong. In fact, I would say that I know he's wrong on how he's handling uh, green energy and how he's handling uh, the regulatory process as it relates to uh, the energy markets. When President Biden came into office, he signed 140 some executive um, orders in his first a couple of weeks in office. And a large number of them literally curtailed or regulated the energy industry, made it more difficult to drill on government land, took some government land and said, you can't drill on it ever. And it'll take another president or an act of Congress to change that. And, and so as a result, what we have and what we have had is a, a series of problems. And what I wanted to start out with, if you look at that article, most Americans don't understand, most people don't understand that there are thousands, ladies and gentlemen, of usage for oil. Oil isn't just to make gasoline or lubricant oil for your engine. Oil is used in making pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, the reason that I wasn't with you, I was in Ann Arbor uh, uh, last last night and yesterday, last night and this morning, uh, my uh, one of my grandchildren, uh, Evelyn, had uh, surgery at U of M and she had her tonsils removed and her adenoids removed and, and then had te- uh, tubes put in her ears. And I was thinking about the fact that the pharma- pharmaceuticals that they gave her as a painkiller have a petroleum base. The tubes in her ears are plastic, all come from oil. But oil is used, pharmaceuticals, makeup, um, heart catheters, pacemakers, hearing aids. Uh, It's used for fertilizers. Uh, You know, there's literally thousands. We've counted at McNair over 6,000 key examples of where petroleum helps make the world a better place and and, uh, helps, uh, uh, you know, you have a better, more productive life. There are thousands of plastic uh, components in an automobile having nothing to do with gasoline or lubricating your engine. You know, from paint to, uh, you know, your dashboard, to your steering wheel, uh, to the covering of the miles of wiring in your automobile, that's all plastic. And that's all from petroleum. And uh, even though we, we're trying to make some substitutes for uh, to make plastics, the vast majority in the world are made from petroleum. And so you look at what happened. Um, I'm not a, uh, I voted for President Trump, but I have some real issues with President Trump. I think um, socially he could use some manners. Uh, economically, he had some great policies. And America did become an independent oil producing nation under his leadership and good policies. And a lot of it had to do with getting rid of regulations. Today, as you look at it, and in the article that uh, Kristen and Lisa and I uh, co-authored, you know, you'll see that when we prevented more oil from being drilled for and and refined in the uh, uh, gasoline and natural gas to be uh, extracted, when we prevented that with regulations, it was one of the reasons why, it is one of the reasons why prices are going up. And if you look at the points that we make in the article, number one, as the price goes up in the world market, Vladimir Putin has more money, more money to do things that we would disagree with, uh, more money in Iran, more money in Venezuela. Uh, when you look at it, uh, you have economies in Europe and the United States more dependent on somebody like Putin. Countries that are ideologically opposed to the freedoms we enjoy here in the United States. You know, that, that was, is, a, is a key second point. 
But the thing that bothers me the most, and, and Dr. Stehar and I talked about this quite a bit in writing the article, is that President Biden claims to be a globalist, and he claims to be a huge believer in green energy. Well, do you realize yeah. that the cleanest oil and natural gas and even coal produced in the world comes out of the United States? And right now, we are producing more Russian oil, more uh, uh, Middle Eastern, Venezuelan oil that is far higher in car carbon content than the U.S. oil that we could be producing or the U.S. natural gas that we could produ be producing. So the end result is we're adding to the carbon footprint rather than reducing it in the United States today. And that's a fact. And so not only are we helping to promote the economies of countries that want to do us harm, but we're not doing green things, we're doing anti-green things. And, and that, that is uh, you know, a, a difficult fact, but it's a true fact. And, and then you, know, you can go on and say, we're putting uh, money in the pockets of people in the Russian economy instead of in the American economy. We've lost tens of thousands of high paying jobs building pipelines and drilling for oil. And that could be jobs that help the US economy that are not right now. Uh, those would be tax dollars paid by those workers that are not being paid. Uh, you have situations where when you look at um, a, a, you know, a whole bunch of different variables, corporations could be more profitable, but they're not. And, and so the profit taxes from those companies are not realized in terms of uh, money to the U.S. government, but it is being realized by countries less friendly to us. And so those are the, th the takeaways as you take a look at or as you analyze the, um, uh, the, the piece on Brace Yourself. You know, the, the, the two big takeaways are that you have less uh, uh, clean energy, more uh, dirty energy being uh, admitted, the byproduct uh, admitted into the air. We are driving up the price of every one of those 6,000 items. As oil prices go up, makeup becomes more expensive. Shampoo becomes more expensive. Pharmaceuticals become more expensive. Plastics become more expensive. You know, everything from a golf ball to a Little League kid's batting helmet, that's all plastic. And, and it's costing us more uh, because of the plastic component in every one of those, those items. So it, it's, it's important to, uh, to take a look at it and to understand that, you know, you, you, you know if you wanna carry the, the discussion further, you know, you think about fertilizers and, uh, and that's driving up the, the, the price of uh, any item, any type of, uh, uh, you know, corn, wheat, et cetera, those are all more expensive because fertilizers have gone up uh, substantially uh, since inflation and the invasion of the Ukraine and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the world oil uh, markets being adversely impacted. So, you know, that, that's, a, I think, an interesting topic uh, if, if you're looking at, um, you know, writing something along those lines. But for, you know, all of you in the room just in general, it's a great example of how in a free market, when you regulate things, you get less of it. When you deregulate it or encourage it, you get more of it. And, and just kind of as a side note, if you look at Europe two years ago and where Europe is, Europe has been moving toward green energy by government dictate for at least four or five years. Dr. Matchek and I are working on a paper that's taking longer than either of us would like to uh, 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 take. But as you look at um, uh, Europe right now, before the war, the cost of electricity per kilowatt hour was three times as high in Europe as it is in the United States before the war took place. Now, right now, it's five times more expensive uh, in some areas of Europe, and natural gas is, it's about five to six 
dollars a BTU, a British thermal unit. That's how we measure uh, um, and, and price natural gas. I know that because my father used to work in the industry. And today in Europe, the average is closing in on $30 a BTU. Before the war, it was three to five times higher. And, and so now you look at Europe, and Europe is saying the wind turbines aren't providing the electricity we thought they would. The solar farms that we built, we cannot produce enough electricity from the solar farms in Europe to be able to light, illuminate homes, power plants, et cetera. And so number one, they found that what they thought electricity could do through quote unquote natural sources, wind farms, solar farms, hasn't worked. And what you, you've also seen is that the Europeans shut down a number of nuclear power plants. And so as a result, they have this huge shortage and they're dependent on two things. One, more natural gas from Russia largely. And then secondarily, because the wind farms and the solar farms are not meeting the demand, it's awfully difficult to repower a nuclear power plant. They're now talking about building new nuclear power plants in Europe, European Union is. But what they are doing is reopening the dirty er coal plants in Scotland, Ireland, England, and parts of Central and Eastern Europe. And so they're gonna end up restarting some of those plants with higher polluting uh, 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 coal that produces more carbon. And, and, and what I would argue is that the market will lead us to cleaner energy. When the market is ready, the market will lead us to cleaner energy. But probably I'll leave that section with this final thought. And, and check me on all these points. If, you, if you're disagreeing with me, challenge me. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the United States has been the world leader out of all the industrialized countries of the world. The United States has been the one country to dramatically reduce its carbon footprint and its sulfuric and nitric oxides over the last 30 years. We have been a poster child for sound uh, uh, reduction in carbon. And so I think that, um, you know, I'm not opposed to green energy. I'm not opposed to electric vehicles. I personally think the answer is hydrogen. And we could talk about that uh, a whole day on hydrogen. Maybe we should have a conference on that here at Northwood. But I, I would simply say that these are the kinds of things that the market will take care of if the market is is allowed to uh, uh, to do so, and and then um, you know the other the other the last one that I'd like to just take a a, a bit of time with is a piece that um, Alan West. He's a famous uh, uh, African American. He was a military hero, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. He was a congressman from uh, great state of Florida. He uh, just lost in the primary to be governor of uh, Texas. He and Dr. McDonald, our wonderful president at Northwood and I, wrote the piece on remembering the Tulsa riots uh, of over just over 100 years ago. And those riots, folks, were terrible. Uh, it was a sign in which we understand that 100 years ago, prejudice was alive and it was terrible. And uh, it, we depict the horrors of that and uh, to say that this will should never happen again. Then we also use some great data in there to point out that minorities have made tremendous strides. And you might want to do a research paper. There's great data by the CELIG, S-E-L-I-G, Center at the University of Georgia. And they have been tracking year by year uh, increases in purchasing power overall and by ethnic code. So whites, blacks, uh, Hispanics, Asians, and uh, Native American Pacific Islanders. And so we took the data and we looked at it because we wanted to see, look, is, is America this terrible racist country or is there a lot of progress being made? 
We know we've got a long way to go, but is there a lot of good progress? So in the, in the article, we take the data from 2010 to 2020. And you know what you find out is that the purchasing power of the United States went from just over, just under 11 trillion in 2010, just over 17 trillion in, in 2020. And then, so you say, all right, that's a 55% increase for overall America. But what you really find out is that Asians increased by over 100% over that period. Remember, the overall, the average for America was 55%. Asians over 100%, almost 110. Hispanics, 89%. Native American Pacific Islanders, 69%. Blacks, 61%. Whites, close to 40%, roughly 44%. So the most rapidly growing groups in the United States are minorities. Whites are still the largest, but the most rapidly growing uh, uh, groups are the minorities. You notice commercials changing. You notice uh, business ownership changing. Uh, we, we have a lot to go to make this country a better place, but there's been tremendous progress. If you looked at the minority countries of the world or of the United States and, and looked at them as countries, you took Blacks, Hispanics, Native American, Pacific Islanders, and Asians, it'd be just under $5 trillion of the equivalent of GDP in 2020. If our, our five minor, our four minority groups formed a separate country, it'd be the number three country of the world. The U.S. would be number one, China would be number two, and our minorities as a country would be number three at almost $5 trillion. If you looked at just blacks, Blacks have the exact same GDP. If you look at 2020, the GDP of Canada, uh, one of the top 10 largest countries in the world, African-American or Blacks, if Blacks were a separate country, they'd be the exact same size as Canada. Now, America's not perfect, but that's, that's a lot of progress that we ought to look at. And I would simply say to you, watch the economy of the future because minorities are getting educated and minorities are working hard and minorities are working smart. Uh, you, 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 can, you look at the data in that article, uh, it's gonna be a more, uh, it's gonna be an economy driven more uh, and more by women, more and more by minorities. And it's happening because it should. And it's happening because in a free and competitive market, you fix those problems that I talked about. And it, and it's um, it's not a perfect country, but I'll tell you what, you don't see many people wanting to leave the United States to go someplace else, but you do see people wanting to come here and be here because overall, uh, I'm an optimistic person, but you, you and I, uh, at least anybody in this room that lives here or is here right now, it's a pretty special place. And it's a special place because of freedom and free enterprise. It's a special place because when we have problems, we fix them. Sometimes a little slower than we'd like, but we fix them and we make, the, we make this, uh, this place, this country a better place. And, and I think, Dan, I think I've got a, a couple of minutes before I take a few, uh, a few questions. So if you don't mind, um, if we'd show the, uh, put those slides up real quick. Uh, there, there's a there's another piece uh, that um, uh, that uh, I'm I'm working on with uh, the estimable uh, uh, Professor Hop, and what I think is important about um, uh, the piece that um, uh, I think I, I think we're gonna get here we go. So if you look at these slides, ladies and gentlemen, um, Jim and I did an analysis of some data produced by the New York uh, University Stern School of Business. And um, one of their finance professors 
has a database where he tracks every year, and he's been doing it for about 40 years now, of, of over almost 8,000 privately, I'm sorry, almost 8,000 publicly traded companies, large companies that are traded on New York Stock Exchange or smaller companies that may be traded on a Philadelphia exchange and not the big board, not New York or or the or, or um, the S and P. It's not in those indices or on the Nasdaq, etc. But the fact of the matter is, so what we did initially is we analyzed um, oil and oil companies because there's been a lot of individuals saying we ought to have windfall profits taxes on oil companies. And we ought to, you know, we, we, we ought to prosecute them for profiteering. So we said, look, in a, in a free market, price allocates scarce resources and price directs production. So when price goes up, it's the signal to the producer to get more of the product in the short run. So we thought it would be accurate to look at these companies and to look at gas prices from 2008 to the end of last year. And here's what we found. If you look at slide number one, it shows that um, oil companies often lost money. Any of the, any of the lines below the horizontal uh, uh, line, which, which shows uh, years, anything below the horizontal line, means that they lost money. And so if you look at oil companies, whether it be a drilling company or a production company, what you see there is many years the oil companies lost money and they never uh, did as well as the average of the industry. So that does not look at uh, an industry that's making windfall profits and, and that industry made less money than the overall uh, uh, economy. You're better off investing in the index of all the publicly traded companies and not the oil industry. So unlike um, popular belief, oil hasn't been a great investment. Last from 2008, you know, almost 15 years, it, it has not been a good investment, as you can see by the charts, versus the industry as a whole, meaning business as a whole. Okay, Dan, let's look at the second slide. Now this one we thought, you know, if you're gonna argue for a windfall profits tax, let's look at the top eight uh, technology companies. So Apple, Amazon, uh, you know, those types of companies uh, versus the Exxon, uh, uh, Mobile, the big oil companies. And, and look at that as an example. You know, if you want a windfall profits tax, which we don't, if you want to say, gee, somebody's gouging you with iPhones or, or uh, you know, the service for your streaming videos or, or for the internet or, or for the delivery of your, your products, uh, look at Amazon, look at Apple. Uh, you know, they're the ones that are making windfall profits if there is such a thing. And, and again, we don't believe in windfall profits taxes, but there's the example of the top eight oil companies versus the top technology companies. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Well, then the third slide uh, that we have here in the article uh, shows a look at uh, the price of oil in nominal terms, meaning not adjusted for inflation. And you can see that we had some really high oil prices. We forget about it. But we had some really high oil prices under uh, President Obama, which led to some high gasoline prices. Uh, and whether you know it or not, the, the all-time record for a, for, a, uh, uh, for a barrel of oil was the summer of 2008, just before President Obama was elected. And it was, uh, it was roughly $158 a barrel. And dollars in 2008 were more valuable than dollars today. And so what we did was we said, all right, here are the prices in nominal terms, what they actually were in dollars. And then we adjusted them for the inflation rate at the end of 2021. And you can see that 
and look at the yellow lines, the tips. Um, the average was three dollars and eleven cents at the end of twenty uh, twenty uh, uh, one, and the the range from high to low adjusted for inflation was less than twenty cents throughout that entire period from two thousand eight to the end of twenty twenty one. And then if you look at the last slide, what you'll see is just the actual numbers of 2008 to 2021, nominal meaning the existing dollar average for that year in those dollars versus the inflation adjusted real rate. And so what you find out is that these oil companies are making certain that you have oil, that you have natural gas, and and they're doing it. and um, and they're not making these crazy profits that people think they are. Uh, they, they, I'll, I'll bet you by the end of this year, the average profit for uh, the oil industry may be up a little bit, but it won't be, it won't be as high as the industry as a whole. And, and, and that's just the market process. And I think that uh, as, as I'm sure they're good people, I think Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, our former governor, Sec uh, Secretary of Energy, Granholm, and, and our president, they're wrong when they call for windfall profits tax and profiteering. The article that these slides are associated with uh, will come out uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, published by the American Institute for Economic Research, which uh, I'm very proud of and very proud to have uh, Professor Hopp as the co-author. So in, in conclusion, here's what I would say to you. We live in the greatest economy in the world if we live in the U.S., and there are a lot of other great countries. Uh, Canada is a great economy. Many free European economies, many free Asian economies that abide by the principles that we describe as the Northwood idea. We, we get through these tough times easier uh, than, than a lot of other places do. But when we can make a difference, when we can cause less pain by not regulating things and by controlling inflation, we need to do it, and and I will say this to you. I, I you know from the first day I taught a class, I always remember the Catholic nuns at St. Mary's in Detroit always saying, "You got to be conscious of the poor. You've got to do what's best for the poor." And I've always been led that way. And when I spent time, privileged to spend time with Milton Friedman on a number of occasions, Dr. Friedman was a not only an incredibly brilliant well-to-do person. He had a gorgeous penthouse overlooking uh, uh, Alcatraz in San Francisco uh, when he won the Nobel Prize. That's where he and Rose moved because you get over a million dollars tax-free. But he was always concerned about people. And he was always worried about the economy taking care of the poorest. And inflation right now is a cruel tax that harms poor people the most. We've got to get inflation under control. And President Trump was right. We need to regulate the economy less, not more like President Biden has done. And uh, with that, I, I would say I'm very optimistic about the U.S. economy long term. We're coming out of this pandemic. Uh, but I, I am worried about the things I've noted today. And I have got a piece coming out in the Midland Daily News tomorrow in which uh, I alone wrote it, so you have nobody to blame but me. But I think there's a 60% chance by next summer we're going to be in a recession. Hopefully a mild one, but um, that's where I see the economy in the next uh, little over uh, a year. And so if you still want to talk to me with that in mind, it's been an honor to be with you. Thank you very much. And I got a few minutes for uh, maybe 10 minutes for Q&A, and I'm ready for them if you are. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Tim, for joining us online. I know uh, your schedule uh, was a little bit difficult, but uh, you made it, so uh, we learned an awful lot from uh, what you had to say this afternoon. I'll be uh, feeding you the questions, and if you're watching online, we do have 17 people joining us online. You can post your question uh, there, and uh, we can read it. So, uh, first of all, let I scan the room, are there any questions for Dr. Nash? Yes, sir. 
Yes, Dr. Nash, um, as you know, our local energy company has switched from coal, natural gas, and nuclear to what they claim is more sustainable wind and um, solar for our energy needs. At what point will they realize that that is not as reliable um, source of, uh, of energy for our, for our area? Well, I'll tell you what, if I had the answer to that, I'd be sipping <laughs> the coladas uh, at my, uh, my, my home in the Caribbean. But um, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the, the, the problem, uh, you know, with, for example, wind is unreliable. And uh, especially, you know, the more you generate it in mid-Michigan, and if you generate it on the coast, it's a little more reliable. But then transmitting that energy is not always as reliable to various parts across the state. And, you know, a day like today is a perfect example. We have uh, a lot more cloud cover in Michigan, uh, and, and solar farms have just not proven capable of meeting the, uh, the, the demand. Uh, you know, I, I was watching um, – or listening on the way back from Ann Arbor, one of the, it was CNBC or, or Fox, but they were interviewing an individual who pointed out that right now there are studies being done that even as you adjust for the higher prices for gas, the study was done before the war, so I, maybe the war prices have changed this a little bit, but they, they, took, they took a group of individuals that own uh, electric cars, and, 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 and then they had a group that have hybrids, which you can run on electricity and or gas, and then people that had gasoline vehicles. But they had two of the three in their household, and they were finding out that it was actually more expensive to, quote, unquote, fuel the car with electricity because of the, the, the price in California, because they're ahead of much of the country in producing wind and uh um, uh, um, you know, solar uh, electrical power, and and they're they're trying not to produce the electricity from oil or coal or or nuclear. So I I think they're going to find out a lot sooner. And the examples in Europe uh, and in the United States indicate that it's uh it's much more of a political move uh, than it is a sheer uh, uh, economics and business play. That that's how I would answer it. Although I, I, I don't have that island uh, home in the Caribbean right now, so I'm, I'm not as well-versed in that as I'd like to be. Dr. Matt checks the environmental uh, PhD in the group. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Nash, Brian McLeod, thank you for your presentation today. Hope you're well. Uh, I was thank you. Curious, curious to know Fed actions. What Fed actions do you think should be taken and at what pace? Uh, uh, thank you uh, for the comments, Brian, and it's a great question. I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a disciple of Friedman and Hayek, and uh, I, I firmly believe that the Fed has overextended. Um, I, I like the idea of, uh, of the half percent increase in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Fed funds rate, but I, I truly believe that the Fed's got to start uh, unloading a lot of the debt that it has. It has to start selling the, the trillions of dollars in securities a lot sooner than they're, they're arguing that they're going to, to do it. And I, I really believe, Brian, in the next two or three months, we're going to see inflation not at 8%, but we're going to see inflation at above 10 and the Fed's going to have no choice uh, to begin to sell a lot of its securities. And what happens, as you know, as a finance guru, we, we sell the uh, debt instruments and we take in dollars and we bring the dollars into the Federal Reserve Bank. Those dollars are out of circulation and interest rates are going to go up. And so that, that's why I think we're going to have a recession. And I think the Fed's going to end up doing both things. Half percent increases the next uh, uh, seven times or six times that it raises interest rates and then uh, before the end of the year. And then it's going to also be rather aggressive in buying back um, uh, um, or selling, I should say, government debt instruments. So those two things I think we're going to see. And I would, here's my, here's my guess. You and I, loser buys lunch. I say that by the end of the year, the Fed balance sheet is below 7 
is below seven trillion. So that means they're going to do the interest rate increases and and sell at least two trillion of the securities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have time for another question. Um, I don't see any from the audience at this point. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think hydrogen will replace renewable energy because of the problem of renewable energy being not reliable or keeping up with demand? Do, do I think that uh, hydrogen will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the answer is yes, I do. And I, th I think the technology is there. I mean, if you look at military vehicles right now, uh, again, it's, it's much more of a regulatory issue. But we are running military vehicles, Hummers as an example. There are a lot of Hummers General Motors produces for the, mar for the military that are hydrogen powered. You, you get the torque, you get the power uh, uh, that you get with gasoline, uh, and, and you have zero carbon emissions uh, with, the, uh, with the hydrogen. You know, the, the, the problem is that we're worried about, you know, fueling the, the fuel cells, et cetera. But uh, we're, we're experimenting already. There are buses in Europe, garbage trucks in Europe that are hydrogen powered, that are very efficient, cost effectively. They're producing zero. All they, all they produce out of the tailpipe is, is uh, water. And, uh, you know, we are building the, the kinds of safety uh, when it comes to uh, uh, fueling the, 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 the vehicle. So I, I, I do believe that it's the best. And I, and I have some inside sources at some of the top oil company or stop, top automobile companies that aren't necessarily willing to be quoted, but that would say the same thing. And that um, uh, you're going to start to see uh, uh, um, hydrogen as more of an ex example. And, I, and I'll leave you with this point. Uh, how many of you watched at least part of the Olympics from Japan this summer? Raise your hands. A decent number of you. Did you notice that the uh, this past summer in in Japan in Tokyo the the Olympic cauldron you know they light the uh, the big Olympic torch. Most people didn't even realize this, but you know what it was powered by or fueled by? It was hydrogen. Uh, the the Olympic flame was fueled by hydrogen, which I think is Toyota and Honda's way of saying. We're, we we like electric, we really like hybrid, but we're not giving up on on hydrogen. And if you notice, the Japanese haven't said uh, anything negative about hydrogen, or they haven't been overly gaga about electricity. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we we are out of time. I just want to follow up on your last uh, answer there, Tim, to put in a little plug for. Uh, the event we have tomorrow night, we've got Derek Kaufman here, and he is talking about the uh, future of transportation technology, and uh, he's an industry insider and consultant, and I think uh, those are the kinds of questions that, uh, if you're interested in that issue, he might uh, have some, some good information for you. So that's uh, tomorrow night at 7.30. And he is phenomenal. He is, I forgot about that, Dale. But Derek is one of the best there is. <laughs> okay, and I want to say, Tim, uh, we could say the same thing for you, and uh, we want to thank, uh, again, the McNair Center and your fine work at the McNair Center for supporting our event this weekend, and uh, uh, wish you well. Thank you very much. Take care.